Awesome. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jaime Profens as our sole seminar online speaker. Jaime is a full professor of genetics and plant breeding at Universidad Politecnica de Valencia. His research program is centered on crop breeding and genetic diversity in, in the Solanaceae, and this includes major crops like tomato, pepper, and eggplant, which is what we're going to be hearing about today, as well as other minor crops, uh, for example, like tree tomato. Um, Jaime has had and continues to have a really productive career, serving as the president of the European Association for Plant Breeding Research, and having published over 180 or so peer-reviewed papers. Um, so I've read many papers from Jaime's group over the years, and so I'm excited to hear him talk to us today, uh, personally today in Soul Seminars Online, about introgression breeding in, in eggplant. Uh, so with that, let's all welcome Jaime. Jaime, you can feel free to share your screen for us. Thank you. Thanks. First of all, thanks for for inviting me to give this this talk, this seminar. And also, it's nice to see uh, some very good friends uh, like Greg, uh, Giuseppe Rotino, Pat Bedinger, and well, and and others. So it's a, a pleasure to to make this presentation. So I will share my screen. Let's see. Okay, so I, I guess that you see my my screen, and well, the the presentation I'm going to to give is about introgression breeding in eggplant. Uh, well, my my first uh, research work uh, on was on on pepino on Solanum muricatum. We had a lot of interaction and I learned a lot with uh, Greg Anderson and but in 2003 we also started to work with uh, with eggplants and since then we have uh, this has been our main line of research in the lab and one of the the works we have done more emphasis is on the use of wild species for uh, eggplant breeding. Well, so with this, uh, I will start. Well, I'm based at the Institute for Conservation and Improvement of Valencian Agrodiversity in Valencia, in Spain. And well, let's see. Let's... Well, uh, as with many crops, as you know, the domesticated crops, uh, eggplant has uh, a very high uh, morphological diversity but the genetic diversity is much uh, less restricted, uh, particularly when you compare it with uh, wild uh, relatives. For example, here, this is a, a tree that was made with around 400 accessions of eggplant and wild relatives. The purple ones are the, the, the cultivated eggplant that is, you can see all of them are in the same branch and they generally have much lower diversity than the wild relatives. This is something that we have seen also with much more, many more accessions and with other type of, of molecular markers. Well, uh, as you know, most of you work with Solanaceae. The, the wild species, in, in this case of eggplant, are much more diverse. And uh, many traits of interest have been identified in the eggplant wild relatives. It's a large group of, of wild species, most of them from the, the old world, from uh, Africa or Southeast Asia, but also some from, from America and from Australia also. And in this uh, group, there is a lot of uh, diversity in terms of adaptation to different environments. For example, uh, eggplant, which is susceptible to drought, like many other crops, while we have many species, many wild species, which are tolerant. Here we have, for example, uh, Solanum incanum, which go grows in semi-desertic areas of Africa. And here you have it uh, fruiting. Solanum eleagnifolium, which uh, for those of you who are from the US, particularly from the south, it's very common. In fact, uh, here, uh, th this is a picture of the wall between uh, the US and Mexico. And you can see it's a very dry uh, environment. And here we have uh, several plants of Solanum eleagnifolium. 
So this species, because of their characteristics, is very interesting for uh, eggplant breeding. Here below, we, we can see what, what happens when we subject under um, experimental conditions plants of different species to drought. For example, here we have the cultivated eggplant. Uh, we have the control, the control and the, the plant subjected to drought in which you see that is uh, very, very uh, affected by, by drought. Here we have Solanum lignanum, which is quite tolerant. You see that the plant from the drought treatment is quite affected, but much less than the cultivated one. Or Solanum incanum, which uh, here we have the control and the plant subjected to drought, which obviously is affected, but much less than the cultivated one. So in, in 2008, but this, this was, this was uh, much more, uh, we, we made a much bigger effort. Uh, in 2013, we initiated an ambitious program for introgression breeding and for broadening, broadening the genetic base of eggplant. Uh, so this was because we, we got a project from the Global Crop Diversity Trust for introgression breeding in eggplant, although we had already done some work before. And uh, well, we, we, pro we even proposed a new approach. We are in the era of omics. So we proposed introgressiomics, which is the the mass scale systematic development of plant materials and populations with introgressions from wild crop relatives into the genetic background of crops that may allow developing new generations of cultivars with improved properties. So this, uh, let's say this new approach that we, we for which we published the paper, uh, we started this program of mass hybridization between eggplant and wild relatives. For this, we started with 15, 15 wild species from the primary, secondary, and tertiary gene pools. Here you can see the cultivated eggplant and fruits from the primary gene pool, Solanum incanum and Solanum insanum, and then fruits from the secondary gene pool, in which we can have, for example, here, I think this is uh, Solanum anguivi, Solanum violaceum and many other species uh, like uh, this one, I think is Solanum lichtensteini and many other species. And we also included in the, in the hybridization program, three American species, which we thought uh, were very interesting. One of them is Solanum torbum, because Solanum torbum is used a lot as a rootstock for eggplant because it has it gives a lot of vigor to the plant and also has resistance to many diseases. And we also included Solanum eleagnifolium. This was a suggestion of Sandy Knapp because Solanum eleagnifolium is very tolerant to drought. And also here we have Solanum sisimbrifolium, which is also very tolerant to soil diseases. So. Uh, apart from the primary and secondary gene pool, we included these three uh, wild uh, American species. Well, as I said before, eggplant is related to a large number of so-called spiny, because they are not spines, as you know, they are prickles of uh, Solanum species. There are some works done by Sandy Knapp and um, her collaborators in which they have studied a lot the genetic diversity and phylogenetic relationships between uh, these um, wild um, relatives of eggplant. So here we have this, uh, this tree of, uh, in which we have Solanum melongena here. As you can see, the diversity is very low compared to the, the whole group of, of wild species. And the closest ones are Solanum insanum, which we know now that is the wild ancestor of eggplant, and also Solanum incanum, which is quite close to uh, Melongena and insanum. Then we have a group of mostly African species, uh, but also some from Southeast Asia, that are uh, considered as the secondary gene pool of eggplant. And among these, 
we selected Solanum Lidneanum, Solanum Lichtensteini, Solanum Campylacanthum, Solanum Violaceum, Solanum Dasifilum, Solanum Anguibi, Solanum Lidi, and Solanum Vespertilio. Both of them are endemic from the Canary Islands and have some particular properties, particularly uh, in the uh, flower morphology. Solanum tomentosum from South Africa, Solanum piracanthos, which is from Madagascar. And well, uh, we included this species for uh, crossing with eggplant. And from, from the tertiary gene pool, we went from for these three American species, Solanum elagnifolium, which by the way is the closest to the uh, old world um, group and also Solanum torvum and Solanum sisimbrifolium, which is not in the, in the tree. So uh, in, in this project that we had with the Global Crop Diversity Trust, uh, we had a project with uh, partners from Sri Lanka, Ivory Coast, and also uh, in later projects from Taiwan and also from Egypt. And what we did was thousands of hybridizations under different conditions. Uh, the reason behind this was because sometimes you don't know why the crosses in one place do not work and in other places work. And this proved uh, very successful because some crosses we obtained it in in Valencia were not obtained in the other places and vice versa. So in the end, we were able to get quite a good number of, uh, of interspecific hybrids between uh, eggplant and wild species. So in the end, we obtained 90 different interspecific hybrids uh, between seeds uh, accessions of eggplant and three accessions of the primary gene pool. Uh, I don't remember the number, uh, more than 10 with the secondary gene pool and with three accessions from the tertiary gene pool. So with Solanum insanum, we got hybrids with all the accessions and for the secondary gene pool, we got hybrids with several accessions, but in any case, for in all cases, we obtained uh, hybrids with at least one eggplant accession. And for the tertiary gene pool, we were able to obtain uh, interspecific hybrids with Solanum elagnifolium and Solanum torvum. Uh, and in these cases, we, we could only obtain the hybrids after embryo rescue. So we harvested the eggplant uh, fruits quite early. You can see uh, this is one inch uh, tag. So the fruits were quite small. The, we rescued the, the embryos. And here we have, for example, these are plants of the hybrid between Solanum melongena and Solanum torbum. So here you can see uh, fruits of the hybrids between eggplant, a sample of hybrids, eggplant and Solanum lichtensteini. Here you have the hybrid, the same with Solanum anguivi. Uh, here again with Solanum anguivi, with Solanum tomentosum, with Solanum incanum, insanum, Lichtensteini, with, again with Anguivi, with Insanum, with Incanum. And surprisingly, uh, we, we obtained uh, the hybrids with Solanum elagnifolium and uh, they gave fruit. Uh, however, the ones with Solanum torvum, they didn't give any fruit. So, uh, well, we, we obtained it. Uh, hybrids with, with Solanum elagnifolium. Here you can see the, the hybrids. These are the fruits of the, of the hybrid, which are uh, similar in size to Solanum elagnifolium. And we were able to obtain bacrosis. It was the first time that bacrosis of an American species with eggplant were obtained using, using the interspecific hybrid as a female. A female. So for the first bacrosis, we obtained uh, 48 different generations of first bacrosis with Solanum insanum, of course, with most of the species of the secondary uh, gene pool and also with uh, Solanum elagnifolium. 
here you can see, for example, the segregation that is obtained in the, the first back cross between Solanum incanum and Solanum melongena. This is the F1, which is purple, like the, the cultivated parent. And here we have a lot of segregation. But one of the first things that uh, surprised us is that even in the first back cross, we recover large fruited um, plants that give large fruits. So this led us to think that there are few genes involved in fruit size in, in eggplant. Here we have more fruits of the first back crosses. In this case with Solanum insanum, you can see the, the large diversity that can be observed. Here with Solanum dasifilum, also with a lot of diversity, including uh, the length of the calyx, prickledness, fruit size and color and so on. So th this is very beautiful for breeders because we like seeing diversity and new recombinant uh, individuals. And this is one of the most exciting things of, of this work of introgression breeding. So of course, each plant of the first back cross is genetically different. But despite this, we, we made a, a big effort of back crossing several plants of the first back cross to the cultivated uh, parent. And so we obtained 33 uh, second back cross generations with several, each, each back cross generation uh, of a cross coming from different plants of the BC1. So in the end, what we had from these uh, BC2 generations, we, we self it in different individuals of 16 of them mostly selected for tolerance to drought. We made an experiment of subjecting the, the plantlets in the nursery to drought, and we selected the most tolerant. And uh, this involved seven different wild species and 137 BC2 plants. And we used a single uh, seed descent approach to obtain, well, uh, to obtain a high diversity of uh, fruits that have introgressions of uh, the, the wild species. So in these materials, uh, which on average have 12.5% of a wild genome, you, we can have fruits that look a lot, many of them alike the cultivated eggplant. Some of them even of large size, others are smaller, but this is a, an elite material with introgressions that is uh, of great utility for breeders. But also, uh, and this is my former slide, uh, we also, sometimes you spot very strange phenotypes in these back cross uh, generations. And we observed one with a dwarf genotype, phenotype in the second back cross with Solanum anguivi. Uh, so we thought this could be a very interesting plant as experimental model, like the microtome in tomato. And so we decided to obtain uh, a fixed line with the dwarf uh, phenotype. So we self it and selected for four generations this, um, the offspring of this original plant. Uh, we observed segregation for the, the plant size. Uh, we also observed that in many cases, it had a determinate uh, phenotype like the, the determinate tomato. So you had that the, the stem finished with, with an inflorescence or with a flower. And well, in the end, we have selected uh, one, one uh, progeny that uh, we call it Micromel from Melongena which uh, we are going to start to test as a, an experimental model for eggplant research. Let's see. Well, apart from this, uh, we, we also performed a program for uh, the development of introgression lines with four wild species. So you know that the introgression lines are a set of lines that uh, the whole genome of the wild species is covered uh, in the set of, of lines, so that each line has a different, a different fragment from the, um, the wild genome. So we, we performed this program with four species, 
One is solanum incanum, which is from the secondary gene pool, which has high content in phenolics of interest for human health and drug tolerance. Also with solanum insanum, which diverged 6,000 years ago from eggplant, which is the wild ancestor of eggplant and has domestication traits for studying. We also uh, used solanum dasifilum, which diverged 3.4 million years ago. One of the good things is that it has a spider mite tolerance and also high contents of phenolics. And then solanum eleagnifolium, which is very far away, uh, 6.7 million years ago, and which has interest for drug tolerance, but also has alkaloids, which are not interest for consuming, but may have some interest if we can develop some uh, introgression lines for pharmaceutical purposes. So with, uh, with Solanum in Canon, we started very early in 2008. This was the first uh, interspecific hybrids we, we made. And we have developed so far 51 introgression lines that cover more than 70% of the genome. We have still not finished despite so many years. It takes a lot of time because you lose generations and so on. And this was our first set of integration lines. And we, we learned a lot what to do and what not to do when uh, obtaining integration lines. But we are still uh, finishing them and obtaining some gaps that we have in the, in the genome. But anyway, we, we tested the integration lines we have uh, in different conditions in climatic chamber, but also in Sri Lanka in the field and in Ivory Coast in the field during the dry seasons. And what we observed that in the three conditions, we observed that there was a stable QTL in chromosome three, which of course we have to confirm, but um, uh, we, we have uh, good hopes that we will be able to have these eggplant uh, backgrounds with increased tolerance to drought coming from, um, from Solanum incanum. Apart from this, uh, we, we not only phenotyped for tolerance to drought, but for many other traits. We had experiments in the open field, also in the screen house, and we detected uh, QTLs for plant height, for stem diameter, for special length for uh, this is uh, sepal length and for uh, college prickles, also for uh, the fruit uh, pedicel length and the fruit weight. So all these QTLs, which are stable, are of great interest for marker assisted selection. And in the cases in which the allele is positive in the wild species for integrating it into, into eggplant. Well, with, with the other uh, species, we have been much faster. We started in 2014, and as we had the experience with Solanum in Canon, and we have many more platforms, we developed a, a platform, as I will mention, and we have been able to go much faster. So nowadays, we are uh, in each generation, we, we used markers scattered all around the genome. First, it was with a sequenome, uh, a sequenome platform, but then we, we shifted to the SPED platform, the single primer enrichment technology platform that allowed us to obtain over 1,000 markers and we could obtain a very good resolution. And uh, in the end, we have uh, we already have a, a good set of integration lines. We are in the BC5 and BC4 S1. And uh, well, we, we, we already have some of them that will start to, to screen in, in the coming year. Here we observed some uh, phenotypes that are uh, of great interest. Solanum insanum is very prickly. Uh, Melongena, the parent, this parent has no prickles, the hybrid is prickly, and the segregation we observed during the program uh, has led us to, uh, to map the prickliness uh, trait 
to uh, a major, a single major gene in chromosome seeds. And we are now in the process of um, identifying the gene. We have two candidate genes, and we hope that very soon we will be able to say which is the gene that uh, is the major responsible of uh, prickles in most of the eggplant uh, cultivars and wild species. Also, uh, new phenotypes appear in the advanced back crosses. Here we have, this is the, the eggplant uh, variety that we use for the Solanum insanum program. You can see that it has anthocyanins and no chlorophyll. It just has anthocyanins. It has no prickles. And then we have the, the wild donor, which is Solanum insanum, which has no anthocyanins, but has chlorophyll and has prickles. So in the, in the uh, segregation materials, in, in the introgression lines, what we have spotted is some, some lines, which as you can see are very, very similar in shape and size to the, to the recurrent parent of Solanum melongena, which has no anthocyanins, like the, the wild uh, insanum, and no chlorophyll like the, the parent, the cultivated parent. We also have some ones that have the anthocyanins of eggplant, but also the chlorophyll of um, Solanum insanum. And even the netting can be appreciated here. And we also observed uh, one line that had round fruits like Solanum insanum instead of elongated fruit. Uh, so these this type of materials are very interesting because they allow you not only to use a, an elite material for breeding, but also for locating the genes and identifying the genes that carry uh, or, or that, that are responsible for very important agronomic traits. Well, with Solanum dasifilum, we also proceeded in the same way. In this case, we had many more markers because it's more far away than, than eggplant, so almost 7,000 markers. This is the, the selected fourth back cross generation in which we also have a, a very good set of uh, advanced back crosses that will become introgression lines. And here we have also the, the Solanum dasifilum parents. This is the cultivated eggplant, which in this case is white, and the, the wild Solanum dasifilum which has chlorophyll. And in the, in the fourth back cross, we have plants that give fruits that are like the, the cultivated parent, but also others which have the same shape, but also inherit the chlorophylls from the cultivated, from the wild uh, Solanum dasifilum. With, with Solanum eleagnifolium, we are a little bit more delayed because uh, it took us, us more than one year to obtain the first hybrids. But anyway, now we are uh, in the BC3, which as you can see, we have obtained quite also good representation of the genome of Solanum eleagnifolium in, in an otherwise uh, Solanum melongena genetic background. And one of the things that we observed is segregation for the root system. This, for example, is Solanum melongena, in which all the crown of roots is very close to the stem. You have a few roots uh, exploring the, the soil. But in the case of uh, the hybrid with Solanum eleagnifolium, here we have that very few roots around the stem and a lot of soil exploration. So this is very good to confer uh, tolerance to drought, as it, and it's one of the characteristics of Solanum eleagnifolium, that it, it explores uh, very deep and also very uh, broad areas of, of soil. So here you can see that when we compare the, the drought tolerance of the two parents, here we have the, the eggplant parent, which is completely uh, devastated by, by the, the drought treatment. And here we have Solanum eleagnifolium. Of course, if you water it, it grows better, but the ones from the drought tre treatment are quite well compared to, to the Solanum melongena. So we have uh, good hopes that we will be able to select some materials 
that have introgressions from uh, solanum eleagnifolium that give higher tolerance to, to drought. Well, an, another one of the things that we did also, because uh, in this case, solanum eleagnifolium also is able to grow in soils that have very low contents of nitrogen with barely any organic matter. Uh, we tested the disadvantaged back crosses under low nitrogen conditions. Here you can see these plants in the row of the middle are watered with uh, nitrogen fertilization and the others are without any nitrogen in the, in the, in the water. And despite this, they grow quite well. Uh, here we have the segregation. This is a cultivated eggplant. This is Solanum eleagnifolium. And these are individuals from the advanced back crosses, some of them as large as the cultivated eggplant. This is the, uh, the graphical genotype of these materials that we tested. But this allowed us to uh, obtain several QTLs for a stem diameter, for prickles in the stem, for prickles in leaf, for the, for the fruit width, for prickles in the calyx. And very importantly, uh, for uh, our interest is uh, phenolic acids because they are of uh, importance and many have many benefits for human health. Uh, phenolic acids of eggplant are, let's say, like uh, uh, a medical pill that because uh, I don't know if you have heard about the green coffee pills, which are based on chlorogenic acid. So eggplant has a lot of chlorogenic acid. And this is known to reduce cholesterol, to, um, to regulate the, the glucose levels in blood. And also it has very interesting antioxidant properties. So we found several uh, QTLs for chlorogenic acid, but interestingly one for the phenolic acids pattern uh, in which we have uh, a very high lot score, which indicates that it's a major gene that affects the, the phenolic acids pattern. So here you can see, uh, this is the, the phenolic acids patterns of Solanum melongena, which basically has chlorogenic acid. So it's basically the, the, the most important uh, phenolic acid of melongena. This is Solanum eleagnifolium, which, which apart from chlorogenic acid has other phenolic acids that have uh, interest uh, also for human health. And the important thing is that uh, Solanum eleagnifolium doesn't have less chlorogenic acid than eggplant. It has the same, but also has more uh, other, other phenolic acids also at high concentrations. And in the F1 hybrid, we, uh, there is an inheritance of most of the uh, important peaks of phenolic acids coming from Solanum eleagnifolium. So by studying the, the phenolic composition of all the, the advanced back crosses, we detected a big, a large QTL in the chromosome one corresponding to the, to the phenolic acids pattern. So this, this QTL we have narrowed it down uh, to uh, 200 um, kilobases, and we have several um, genes identified that are good candidates for this different pattern of phenolic acids. Well, apart from the uh, introgression by back crossing, another strategy that we have followed, because it's also very interesting from a breeding point of view, is what we call a magic populations. A magic population is a multi-parental uh, population. In this case, we used eight parents, morphologically very diverse, including one wild species, which is this one, C, which is Solanum incanum. So we obtained the interspecific, uh, so the hybrids, the F1 hybrids, the F1 hybrids, we intercrossed them and we obtained the double hybrids in which each plant is completely different. And so in this generation, we used a chain pollination scheme in which one plant was the male of the following plant. And in this way, uh, we obtained uh, a large number of um, four way, uh, sorry, of uh, eight way recombinants or quadruple hybrids 
that have uh, genomic fragments from the eight parents. So these plants in which we started with 516 plants, we have been selfing them for three generations and we are still continuing selfing them until the fifth um, selfing generation. And this uh, is, will represent or represents um, a set of the largest experimental population in eggplant, the largest uh, experimental recombinant uh, population in, in eggplant and has started to give some satisfactions to, to us. Also, one important thing is that we have two cytoplasms represented in the magic population. One is the cytoplasm of the wild in Canum, and, then, and the other one is the one of Melongena. So we do not have only a mixture of eight genomes, but we also have some lines that have cytoplasm of Solanum in Canum and others with the cytoplasm of Melongena which allows us to, to study also the effect of the cytoplasm. So these, uh, these 420 individuals of the third generation of selfing were, were phenotyped, uh, sorry, genotyped with the single primary enrichment technology platform, which was one that we developed in the G2P soil project with other colleagues from Enea and the University of Turin and Crea Montanaso Lombardo. And well, uh, this, this platform is very convenient because for a, a low price, 17.5 euro, uh, you can get uh, after filtering 7,000 uh, markers. So it's the, the price per marker is very, very low. So with this, we could genotype the, the population and we also phenotyped them for three traits. We, we didn't grow them to adult plants. We just uh, observed small plants that we use for speed breeding, for selfing uh, very quickly. And we observed the, the presence or absence of plant anthocyanins, the presence of or absence of fruit anthocyanins, and the presence or not of the uh, purple undercalic trait in which this means that anthocyanins, the synthesis of anthocyanins depend on uh, the presence of light. If there is no light, there are no anthocyanins. So, well, the, the genotyping results uh, revealed 6.3% of uh, heterozygosity in the S3 generation, which is equivalent to an, an S4 generation. And we expect to obtain around 1.6% 1, 1 in the S5, which we can then consider um, fixed uh, lines. Uh, also, by observing the heterozygosity in the individuals, uh, most of them had low heterozygosity. The double hybrids, as expected, had high heterozygosity. And well, this means that the population is quite well um, we, we obtained what we expected. Uh, we also performed a, a PCA uh, in which we included uh, the genotyping data of, of the parents and also the interspecific hybrids. Here you have Solanum in Canum. Also this accession from Asia is very far away uh, from the other ones. And uh, the hybrids plot in the intermediate region. Here you have parent E and F, here in the middle is E, E, F. Uh, here you have parent C and here you have D and the hybrid is intermediate. And the magic population plotted uh, in an intermediate way uh, among the parents and, and hybrids. And we didn't observe uh, genetic differentiation among groups with different cytoplasms. So two important things. We have no genetic structure. The PCI didn't reveal genetic structure and no genetic differentiation between uh, cytoplasms. Of course, we also observed a wide diversity in the magic population. Uh, these are the parents and these are new phenotypes, which there was a lot of diversity. Uh, on average, these materials must have 12.5% of the of the wild Solanum in Canum genome, but despite this, many of them look like 
cultivated eggplant, also for the uh, flower color, there is a very big diversity. And by looking at these three simple traits and performing a GWAS analysis, we detected several uh, QTLs for plant anthocyanins and fruit anthocyanins and purple undercalids uh, in chromosome 10. Probably it's the same gene uh, controlling um, a large part of the variation in this trait. But also we found other, other, um, other QTLs that were present in other chromosomes that affected plant anthocyanins, fruit anthocyanins, and also the purple undercalids. Well, by using the, the Manhattan plots, the local Manhattan plots and linkage disequilibrium um, heat maps, we were able to select some candidate genes for uh, anthocyanins contents. And here we have, for example, these uh, R2 uh, transcription factors MIP 113 from chromosome uh, 10 and from chromosome 1, which we think they are duplicated genes. And we found some mutations in them, frame shift mutations and disruptive in frame deletions in uh, the, the parents that do not have anthocyanin. So this one is green, this one is green, this one is white. They do not have anthocyanins and they have uh, mutations that affect uh, the, um, this gene. And the same happens with uh, this candidate gene for chromosome one, in which we have some mutations in the gene in the three um, parents that do not have anthocyanins. So we are very confident that this magic population with introgressions from Solanum incanum will also be very useful for eggplant breeding and the studying of domestication and uh, many traits of interest in, in eggplant. Well, and in order to finish, the take home message is that uh, while eggplant relatives are an important source of traits for and genes for eggplant breeding, in particular for stresses, but also other traits of agronomic interest, the development of advanced back cross generations and integration lines is possible with many wild relatives, including from the primary and secondary gene pool, and with at least a, a tertiary gene pool species, which is Solanum elegnifolium. Uh, the de development of magic populations, including one or more wild parents, is also another way of introgressing and broadening the genetic base of eggplant. And well, we observed that the use of high throughput genotyping platforms has facilitated a, a lot the selection and the speeding up the interaction line development program and the use of magic populations in breeding for adaptation to climate change. And with this, I want uh, to thank, uh, of course, the people, the people in my group. Uh, I, I'm fortunate to have uh, a, a group of young and enthusiastic people that uh, love their work. And so uh, I want to thank them as well as the our funders, the European Union, uh, the Ministry of Science in Spain and the Global Crop Diversity Trust. And of course, our colleagues from uh, other institutions uh, that participated in this crop trust project uh, from the University of Peradenia. We have Ramia, Gemal, uh, Mudita, Tarangani, also from the University Felix of Fuet Boigny from from Sri Lanka, we have uh, Abu, Breeze, and August. From the Kafr el Sheikh University in Egypt, here we have Mohammed, and from the also from the World uh, Vegetable Center, and the rest of people from from the lab, of course. And well, that's uh, all. Uh, thanks for for your attention, and I hope you like it. And I'm open to. To your questions and discussion. So I, I guess I should stop sharing presentation. Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jaime, for the fantastic talk. Uh, yeah, so like Jaime mentioned, uh, well, now we have plenty of time for questions. So if you want to uh, either just unmute or uh, put your question in the chat and I can read it out loud. 
<clears throat> so I see there is a question in the chat. Yeah, so we have a we have a question from Stacy, which is being communicated through Luke. Uh, so Stacy Smith asks, this was or says this was so interesting, and I was really impressed to see how widely you can cross among the species. I was wondering if you needed any special tricks to get those interspecific crosses to work. I'm also interested in the genetic basis for anthocyanin expression in the eggplants. Did you see any segregating anthocyanins in the flesh? And are the QTL for that uh, the same as for the skin? Uh, I'm wondering if the regulators might be different for skin versus flesh. Yeah, uh, well, uh, it was a, a big surprise to us because in general, when you cross with wild species, there are uh, difficulties in obtaining interspecific hybrids. So um, uh, it was a real surprise that, uh, except for Solanum cisimbrifolium, we were able to obtain interspecific hybrids. Of course, we have uh, people who is well trained and they are very skillful in making the 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 hybrids. But only in the case of Solanum elegnifolium and Solanum torbum, the trick we used was embryo rescue, uh, because some fruits that uh, rip, ripened, uh, the seeds were aborted. So we we uh, we went for uh, embryo rescue. Uh, jokingly, in the lab, we said that eggplant is very promiscuous, so crosses with everything. Uh, for, for example, uh, here there are people who work with tomato. Uh, can you imagine crossing a tomato with an old world species? It's it, you can cross it only with a very few species which are very close relatives. However, here you you are able to cross it with uh, American species. And well, this was a complete surprise. At, at the beginning, I thought it was a mistake. I said, okay, this must be a pollen contamination or so on, or a mistake in the crossing, but no, it, it was. And well, for, for the other, um, the genetic basis for anthocyanin expressing in the uh, eggplant, we, we haven't seen, um, anthocyanins in the flesh. Sometimes what you observe is uh, chlorophyll, uh, a green ring of chlorophyll around the, the skin, but not anthocyanins in the flesh. Uh, the genes are there and probably anthocyanins in the flesh using some, some gene editing techniques uh, may be achieved or with genetic transformation, but we, we, we didn't observe it. And uh, well, uh, regarding the regulators, we cannot say anything because there are no anthocyanins in the flesh. Great, great. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, a question from Pat Bettinger, uh, short question. Wonderful, did mating system affect ability to make hybrids? Yeah, it, uh, looks, like, it looks like perhaps most of the, the uh, barriers you see are post-zygotic or, or yeah, tell, tell me about that. Well, uh, the, the wild species we have worked with are self-compatible. Uh, okay. So you 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 can you can just self them and you get uh, offspring. So we we didn't observe. Of course, we uh, it's easier to obtain the hybrids if you use the the wild species as male, because fruit setting in the wild species sometimes it's very challenging. Uh, they do not set well because of the photo period or other conditions in the greenhouse. So we use it always or almost always as the, the male parent, but we didn't observe any, any effect of um, having uh, andromonoesius inflorescences or other type of, of uh, reproductive characteristics that affected the ability to obtain hybrids. Great, thank you. We have a question from Zach Lippman too. Uh, first he says, great seminar. Uh, then uh, just wondering to what extent do you see co-localization of known QTL with other uh, Solanaceae species? Yeah, this is something that uh, of course having tomato, uh, which is also another Solanum and many QTLs in tomato have been 
uh, observed and are known. Uh, we, for some of the QTLs, we 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 were able to um, to find a colo colocalization with with tomato. Of course, after looking for the the um, uh, how do we, I, I forgot the the name the. Um, when the chromosomes break and go to, from one place to the other, um, well, uh, but yes, we 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 observe an inversion. Yes, inversions and translocations. Now it came to my my mind, and uh, yes, and we we found for some of them, but for others, for example, prickles. Uh, tomatoes have no prickles, so for this case, we we could not. What we could do is to find some colocalization with um, with genes in Arabidopsis that affect um, the the development of trichomes, and uh, well, this is one of the things that we we do is looking for synteny with other solanaceae and also with Arabidopsis. Thanks, Jaime. Maybe I can quickly follow up. Um, I'm most interested in some of these QTO where long read sequencing has revealed that the variants are actually tandem duplications of genes. We and others have found this. And, and I wonder whether you've got uh, sufficient quality genomes yet to start to ask that question where you might find that independent yeah. doubling well, of, of the genes are giving you that dosage effect, which would be quite cool if it happened because of some sort of hypersensitive region towards uh, transposon yeah. duplication. So, so uh, we, uh, the parents of the magic population were resequenced at uh, a depth of 20x. So we could look at the, at the parents, not, not in the segregating population. We detected the QTL and then we went to the, to the genomes of, of the parents. And we observed that there is one region in chromosome one which seems to have been a, an ancient duplication of uh, a region on chromosome 10. But of course, and also with the, with the sequencing of the genomes uh, of the eight parents, we also detected some natural introgressions in some small uh, places of the genome. Hmm. It'd be fun to maybe talk all offline. We, we might have some data that might be really synergistic with what you're doing on long read sequencing in African egg yeah. ancestors. Okay, yeah, that would be very nice. Fantastic. Are there any other questions for, for Jaime? Matt, just a couple of comments. Um, okay. I thought it, this was Greg Anderson, a spectacular combination of traditional plant breeding and molecular genetics, especially focusing on introgression. And Charles Heiser would be very proud to see the degree to which introgression has, is being used in crop improvement. Um, and two other comments, the micromel might uh, get you money from somebody's space program because microtoms, I think, are mm. being developed for the space something. So, you know, there might be big money there for you, Jaime. And then I wondered which side of the wall the photo was taken of the wild thing. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't take it myself. I, I took it from, uh, from the internet uh, because I saw uh, news about the, the wall uh, between uh, Mexico and uh, the U.S. and said, well, here we have Solanum elegantifolium in first, uh, which is the first thing you see. And in fact, we, we, we had a conversation with, uh, with, we had a seminar from uh, a professor from New Mexico State University and talking after that about uh, Solanum elegantifolium, she just uh, opened the window of the garden and said, it's full of elegantifolium mm -hmm. around there. Yeah. Fantastic. If there are any more questions, then I'll, I'll just go ahead and wrap up. Thank you again, Jaime, uh, for the fantastic talk. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. I'll say one thing before we, before we leave. Um, next week, we'll have Helen Tai presenting at the Soul Seminars online. She'll be talking about uh, Solanaceae and the insect herbivore, the Colorado potato beetle. So. Be sure to tune in to that. 
uh, next Friday. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jaime, and thank you, okay, everyone. Okay, th thanks for, to you. It's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Bye to everybody.